Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the uh, business meeting of the Governing Board of the South Florida Water Management District to order. It's uh, September 14th, 2023. Uh, our first order of business always is the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So, Mr. Butler, would you like to lead us in the pledge? If we could all stand and face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Let's see, I've got Vice Chair Wagner, Mr. Bergeron, Mr. Martinez, and Ms. Roman. You're all participating by Zoom today. If you want to say something, that would be nice. Vice Chair Wagner, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Mr. Bergeron. Yes, sir. I'm here, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon to you, Mr. Martinez. I'm here, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Thank you. And Colonel Roman, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Was yesterday your birthday? Well, yeah. No, you don't have to answer that. Okay. Just, just. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, belated. Anyway. Uh, board members, I'm going to ask to make sure your microphones are on um, and you please speak into the mic so online attendees can hear you. If you turn your head while you're speaking, drag the mic with you so you, you make your comment, make sure your comments are captured. Uh, members of the public on Zoom who wish to address the board may use the raise your hand feature. If members of the public are having any trouble and need help, please go to our website, sfwmd.gov, and click Ask Us button, and we'll help you out. If you're using a phone and you'd like to comment, please press star 9 to raise your hand and star 6 to mute and unmute. It's a courtesy to others who wish to speak. Members of the public are asked to comment only once on each topic. We'll take public comment first from those who are here in person and submitted a comment card, followed by those who raised their hands on Zoom. After today's business meeting, we will host the public hearing on fiscal year 2023-2024 tentative millage rates, tax rolls, and tentative budget at exactly 5.15 p.m. So this, this meeting will be done by 5.15. The Zoom meeting link will remain the same as it was for this uh, as it was for this meeting. Um, and board members, please be advised that we cannot start the budget hearing early or late. So let's move now to employee recognitions with Mr. Bartlett. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm happy to announce that our September 2023 Employee of the Month is Alexandra Onisco, Invasive Sp uh, Species Biologist Senior in our Plant Vegetation Management section. Alexandra. <laughs> So, Mr. Chair, I know you know how important the control of invasive plants is in South Florida. And as we drive around South Florida, once you know what invasive plants are, you see them everywhere. And so, Alexander has brought a specialty to the South Florida Water Management District on how to better manage uh, that spread of those invasive plants through technology, through science, and through that kind of leadership. She works directly with all of our plant management folks, I mean our land management folks, to really implement and explore new techniques and procedures, and she's bringing that innovation to the South Florida Water Management District. And by the way, she's really embraced our herbicide reduction strategy for the control of those uh, exotic plants. So I'm gonna finish with that too, but as a person, uh, she's one of those uh, folks that strides forward, uh, inserts herself, shows that leadership to come up with new ideas, uh, implement new projects, new programs. And when we've, of course, we have uh, staff turnover and those types of things, she jumps in and helps us with those as well. In addition, Alexandra is jumping into some leadership roles. She serves as co-chair of the Treasure Coast Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area Conference, where <clears throat> it takes everybody to control these exotic plants. And so they all come together in the Treasure Coast to, to work together to try to control that spread of, of invasive plants. And then she's bringing her expertise to the Kissimmee River restoration, particularly with respect to grass um, up there to make sure that ecosystem responds. The, but the one thing I wanted to highlight is she is uh, doing trials on the control of Brazilian pepper. We see Brazilian pepper everywhere. Um, and through these, troll, these controls, it is proving effective with the reduction of herbicide use by 97%. So it's saving herbicide use by 97% and saving 40% in costs. 
and controlling Brazilian pepper. So it's one of those innovations that she's bringing to us, and that is why we're bringing her to you as our September Employee of the Month. Congratulations, Alexandra. For our September 2023 Team of the Month, it's the Lower West Coast Hydro Hydrogeology Update Team. That's Aurora Boucher, Patricia Casey, Greg Cook, Stacy Kuntz, Seamus English, Elizabeth Gadiz, Steve Krupa, Sonny Siani, and Justin Zumbro. <clears throat> now, so, the Lower West Coast communities very much depend on our aquifer system for their sustainability. And we are updating the Lower West Coast aquifer model, ge hydrogeology model. And what every model depends on is a solid data set underpinning that model. And that's what this team brought to the Southwest Coast. We had data for the aquifers from a, a, a number of wells uh, to understand those aquifers. But since that's been updated, there's been a thousand more wells put in Southwest Florida. And so this team got together and mined all that data from those thousand wells to understand that where the aquifer begins and ends, top, bottom, transmissivity, leakage, confining layers, everything throughout Southwest Florida. That's a lot of data. So they, took, they also used scripts to interpolate between those wells. So here you have a bunch of data coming in, managing that data, interpolating between the data to come up with a brand new GIS layer of an aquifer system in the southwest coast based on substantial data. So we know it's a good data layer. I mean, quite frankly, it's a geologist's dream to have that kind of knowledge underground. And this team pulled, get, got together, brought it together, and delivered it so that we can now build that model based on that sound science. Um, this is what kind of, I just, it's a hallmark of the South Florida Water Management District, bringing that, that cutting edge science, that knowledge uh, to the forefront uh, in Florida. And we are constantly recognized for it and I constantly present teams to you. But that's what this team is, that data, that hydrogeology. Congratulations, September Team of the Month.
All right, I have one 25-year service award to recognize today. You might know him. It's Akina Wosina. He's the Bureau Chief of Hydrology and Hydraulics in the Water Management District. Thanks, Akin. <laughs> there. So, Akin came to us in 1998, and he worked in the Fort Myers Service Center on the West Coast. And to this day, he's got great relationships on the West Coast that we depend on. Uh, but he worked his first number of years at the, in that service center until he became sort of head of the service center over there. But then in 2003, he became the manager of the IMC. If you don't know what IMC is, it's the Interagency Modeling Center. It's us and the Corps of Engineers. And when we're doing work with the Corps, we say IMC a lot uh, because that is the modeling center that underpins all the planning projects, all the operational plans, everything that we do. And Akeen is a founding father of that uh, management center, uh, modeling center between our agencies. And everybody looks to that center and everybody wants to be a part of that center, quite frankly, because it is cutting edge uh, and, and great work. But then he became a section leader and then became bureau chief in 2014 uh, of hydrology and hydraulics. And I'm constantly recognizing our modelers to you. It's because the, the atmosphere that Akeen fosters in that bureau. We've got cutting edge models, cutting edge modelers um, that are innovative, creative, and it's that atmosphere that he creates to, to really set us up to be that honestly nationally recognized uh, entity when it comes to water modeling uh, in Florida. And so He's, he's also sort of spearheaded our flood risk management with flood protection level of service. There's so many things. Just sit down and talk to him. You just have great conversations about, about what we're doing in the South Florida Water Management District. And it's because he brings that leadership that we so value. The other thing he's a great leader in is plants, like fruit trees in particular, uh, because he, he has a class at the Water Management District of grafting mangoes. He has a whole variety of mango trees at his property, and he knows them all, and he tells them to me, and I promptly forget. Um, <laughs> but he, he, takes, he will hold a class where he will bring our little saplings in, or he may give them to us, and we'll graft you know, beautiful, tasty mango twigs they look like onto these trees and then we have a new and we go plant it in our yard and if you're me they survive if you're Jen they don't <laughs> <laughs> barely survived I might say <laughs> so it's it's a great service he does for us and, and that's what he's known for he brings mangoes to me uh, every spring summer June so there's a saying, uh, oh, by the way, he uh, has a wife of 25 years and four kids, and if he raised them like he does his bureau, I'm sure they turned out great. Um, when he started, he said it was, he's going to come here and work for three years. Um, but it's, he's, he, he jokes that it's been a very long three years because he realized that the grass is greener at the Water Management District. So thank you, Kakeen, for your 25 years of service. <laughs> Well, Mr. Chair, that's it for folks in the room, but I do want to acknowledge that uh, Julie Maytock, who has uh, put our balanced budgets together for years and years, has also served for 25 years, and I just want to thank her, Julie, for your great service. That's all I got, Mr. Chair. No, thank you, Drew, and, and thanks to you all for all you do for the, the district. Um, next, we have a, 
agenda revisions. Uh, Molly, are there any changes to the agenda? There were none, Mr. Chairman. Great, and then we'll go to um, item abstentions by board members. And I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Steinle. Do you have anything? You I have none. Okay, I have none. None. Mr. Butler? I have none. Uh, Vice Chair Wagner? None. Thank you. Mr. Bergeron? None. Thank you. Mr. Martinez? None. Thank you. And Colonel Roman? I have none. Thanks. And does anyone have changes to the uh, minutes for the August 17th meeting? Uh, hearing none, does someone like to make a motion and a second? Move to approve the minutes. Thank you. I have a second. I have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. Uh, Mr. Steinle? Yes. I'll vote yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Vice Chair Wagner? Yes. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Colonel Roman? Yes. Thanks, and that passes unanimously. Mr. Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I'd like to start uh, my executive director's report by thanking the Florida Legislative Budget Commission uh, for approving $43 million uh, to continue the repair, necessary repairs of our aging flood control system. They met last Friday and approved that $43 million to continue that. And as you know, flood control is not an option, right? We have to provide flood control for our 9 million residents and communities that depend on our primary canal system to move water <coughs> away from them. But you also know that that system is more than 60 years old because uh, it was built in the 60s and our field stations have done yeoman's work to keep them going, keep them operating in preparation for all the flood control needs of our communities and water supply needs. Uh, but at some point, they need to be refurbished, replaced, or upgraded. And so this funding is greatly, greatly appreciated. We have about 100 structures that are in need of urgent repair. Um, and so this funding is very much appreciated. I just want to thank them as I lead off my executive director's report. Um, we also recently uh, completed a flood protection level of service um, analysis for five different basins in Miami-Dade County. And so you may recall, well, the Central and South Florida flood control system, these primary canals, when they were put in place, uh, they were providing a level of service where you'd expect flooding less than 5% of every year, right? Just not very much flooding, they, they would work very well. But what's been challenging the system lately is sea level rise. These canals drain to the ocean by gravity, and there are many times during the year where, particularly in Miami-Dade County, where the downstream tide is higher than the canal, and so you can't open the gate when it's raining, right? So right now, given our level of the sea level rise to date, we're seeing about a 10% chance of flooding every year down there, but when you look at projections of sea level rise, you're gonna get greater than 20%, sometimes much greater than 20% by the end of the century. Um, when looking at those sea level rise projections. So I raise all that just to paint the picture of the urgency of it, but then to pivot and highlight the work of the staff, both that put together and the contractors that put together uh, the flood protection level of service analysis to really inform it, but then feed into uh, Carolina Moran's resiliency team to put together grant applications so we can address this issue. Uh, last year, we got $50 million for the S28 structure to take that gravity-fed system and put pumps on it to provide that flood control. This year, but after last meeting, probably about two weeks ago, we got informed that we got two more $50 million grant awards for the S27 structure and the S29 structure. And that's because of the good work of the teams putting together that technical information and putting together real solid grant applications for very expensive projects. Because getting a $50 million grant out of that pot is big deal, is a big deal. So now they're up to $150 million. Each one of these structural retrofits costs between $150 and $200 million to do. So we're continuing to partner with FDEP, the Florida legislature, the Corps of Engineers, um, all kinds of partners, local governments, to try to put together the projects as we begin to start the design of these structures and these pump stations so that we can move into construction fluidly. So just wanted to brag on the team for getting us another $100 million. The other thing you're doing today is considering a budget for 2024. Um, and so I really wanted to spend some time highlighting what we would hope to accomplish next year with that robust budget. Um, staying on resiliency, we will start the Corbett Levy uh, project in Palm Beach County to get that rebuilt. 
uh, or built. Uh, and then we will also implement flood protection level of service, start that program for Palm Beach County and the Upper Kissimmee chain of lakes in fiscal year 24. In water supply, we're going to finish the East Coast groundwater model to track ground, the aquifers on the East Coast, particularly with respect to saltwater intrusion. And we'll also complete the five-year update. where that has progressed or receded over the last five years, and then we'll adopt the Lower East Coast Water Supply Plan. We're also going to develop more tools in our toolbox. We're going to partner with NASA and the Civil Air Patrol to advance our algae surveillance systems uh, for our estuaries in, in Lake Okeechobee. And then in our infor information technology group, we're adding Power BI and Google Science Platforms to our IT infrastructure so we can advance analytical work and business decisions uh, using new tools in our, that, that will, will be at our fingertips. In our land management areas, we're going to re, uh, replace public restrooms at stormwater treatment areas. We're going to get two boardwalks repaired uh, at, at, at our recreational areas and refurbish a parking lot in Martin County at Nine Gems. We're going to continue tackling the exotics at Picayune Strand. We're gonna, we got 20,000 acres targeted for prescribed burn. Next year, we're going to continue our herbicide dependency reduction strategy, uh, protect public health from the toxins associated with harmful algal blooms, and remove another 2,000 pythons in partnership with FWC. What we all like to talk about and we talk about frequently is our restoration projects, our ecosystem restoration projects. We are going to finish the seepage wall around the Las Palmas community next year to keep water in the park and keep water flowing through the park. Um, on the southern, towards Florida Bay in the southern part of our system. We are going to finish all of our stormwater treatment areas and flow equalization basins to deliver clean water to the Everglades to protect that ecosystem from phosphorus contamination. We are going to start the construction of three brand new culverts on the levee between Water Conservation Area 3A and Big Cypress Preserve so that we can take water that's stacked up in 3A and move it over to Big Cypress Preserve down Lossman Slough to Florida Bay and start that hydrologic restoration. And I want to pause to thank the Corps of Engineers. We want to bring those contracts to you this fall. Um, we needed some agreement signed by the Corps, so I engaged uh, General Hibner and Colonel Booth, and they have turned around paperwork lickety-split to try to get that, those agreements in place so that we can not be delayed in getting those new, new culverts started. We are going to start the C2324 South Reservoir in St. Lucie County to grab water that otherwise would get shunted to St. Lucie Estuary and Indian River Lagoon in a harmful way. We are going to start the C25 Reservoir up in St. Lucie County to protect water going out at Fort Pierce uh, from the C25 Canal so we can capture that as well. Uh, we are going to award the final contract for the Cutler Wetlands Restoration on Biscayne Bay. Uh, we are going to award, uh, develop, and bring to you hopefully more contracts for the SEP North components uh, to move water, more water properly into the central Everglades. We are going to position ourselves to get authorization for the Western Everglades Restoration Project and the Northern Reservoir above Lake Okeechobee, above ground reservoir. Two authorizations in order 2024 that we'll continue to work with the Corps and stakeholders to present. We are going to bring a project referred to as Cypress Creek Restoration, which is on the North Fork of the Loxahatchee River. Um, that's taking an old row crop and converting it back to a wetland, natural hydrology on that river. We are going to break ground on the Lake Hickpachee Phase II flow equalization basin uh, in the Caloosahatchee watershed to protect the Caloosahatchee estuary. We are going to break ground on the new Okeechobee Field Station which will bring expanded capacity to manage all of our new projects in Okeechobee County and in the northern part of our district, not the way northern, but north of Lake Okeechobee. Uh, plus, that, that facility will include a backup operations center should the main campus get incapacitated. We are going to, you may have heard us talk about the wetland restoration called Abiyaki. It's in the C-139 basin, but it's a massive former citrus field, turning it, turning it back into a wetland, former Everglades, back into the Everglades. We will finish uh, restoration areas one and two and begin restoration areas four and five for that 
multi-thousand acre wetland restoration project. And then finally, we will start work on the EAA reservoir pump station and we will finish work on the EAA reservoir stormwater treatment area next fiscal year to have more tools in our toolbox to move water south from Lake Okeechobee with that new stormwater treatment area. Mr. Chair, that is a lot of work. That is a lot of work we have on our plate for next year. But I really want to thank FDEP for their support in this. I want to thank Governor DeSantis for this leadership and putting us in this position. The Florida Legislature for appropriating the funds to put us in this position. Uh, the Corps for being a good partner. But really I want to conclude by thanking the staff at the South Florida Water Management District who put up with me and John and us always asking for our schedules and time frames and so forth to put us in, you know, to achieve even more now uh, for Florida's environment than we have in the past. Um, it's a great opportunity for all of us and we're happy to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bartlett. I think that, you know, as long as they keep providing us gas, we're going to keep the our foot to the floor, <laughs> and it seems like we are. It's going to be a, be a wonderful year. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions for Mr. Bartlett on his executive director report? Is that it? That's all. No, you, that, you, that, that's all that's in the budget. Yeah. <laughs> what about my? Uh, Congratulations. No. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm glad y'all. Uh, it's it's going to be dense. I look forward to it in three hours. Yes. Uh, now we're going to move to general public comment. Uh, we'll move into our first public comment period. If you're here to comment on a specific agenda item, we ask that you hold your comment until we reach that item on our agenda. I think there's only one. Uh, this comment period is for general comments not related to agenda items, and I really appreciate everyone helping um, that. Public comment for consent agenda item is 11 on the agenda, and public comment for one discussion item will be held after that. Presentation, the public had an opportunity to provide written comments prior to the meeting. Uh, we did not receive any uh, e-comments. Uh, so now we'll move to general public comment. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we will start with Newton Cook, followed by Jake Foytick. Thank you, Newton Cook, United Waterfowl of Florida. Now I know why we got that big sign out front hiring. <laughs> That's quite a plate that you got there uh, to fill. Uh, and I might add a lot of it says marsh wetlands, marsh wetlands. And as a duck hunter, that, uh, that's good to hear. In fact, duck season starts Saturday <laughs> at the SDAs, which I'll talk about briefly. Uh, first of all, most important thing is right here in this room on March the 25th at 5 p.m., we have the uh, second of the annual uh, recreation uh, meetings for the district. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll outdraw this group. <laughs> we, we draw a pretty good crowd, plus Zoom. Uh, the, uh, the stakeholder presentation will be by the refuge, uh, Loxahatch Refuge. They've done a lot of work out there for, uh, on the recreation side. And then we have an up, upper chain of lakes on the Kissimmee, a lot of work going up there, burning exotics and new recreation opportunities. Python program is always interesting. An overview of SHEP and uh, the benefits of the projects and volunteers by Mark Cheek at the end. So everyone's invited. Uh, always glad to see a governing board member come sit in. They, uh, they're pretty tame meetings now. They used to be more exciting, but I kind of like the tame ones better. <laughs> um, I also like to thank the uh, district and the FWC here for the uh, work on the STA that we do a tour every year and try to make the best hunting opportunities we can with the construction and the cattails. And boy, these people work really hard and the staff works really hard uh, to get the parking spots up. So at four o'clock in the morning, when a guy drives up in his truck with his kayak and he's never been there before in the pitch black dark and he's standing there on the levee, there's this parking number, but he's gotta be able to see water out there somewhere. And uh, the district has been very helpful this year as they've kind of helped get some access to the uh, open water through the cattails. And that's going to be very, very helpful um, to people. And it'll also stop people from making the big paths. they got a way to go. They don't have to make a path. Um, and the FWC officers are just wonderful, wonderful. And the staff that's out there. We dodged a bullet with this storm. <laughs> uh, a couple hundred miles south, we'd have a 17-foot lake today. A couple hundred miles south, and the estuaries of St. Lucie would be being bombed. And with an extra foot of water in the lake, that's 500,000 acre feet. 
We're still gambling. The lake's almost 16 feet. One storm, that's all it's going to take. We don't have any SAV in the lake. Less than 2,000 acres. The water's getting dirtier every day. Sooner or later, it's going to go east and west and south. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cook. We'll hear next from Jake Foytick, then move to our virtual participants, Mark Perry, followed by Scott Martin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Board. Uh, Jake Foytick, Assistant Director of Government and Community Affairs for the Florida Farm Bureau Federation. I uh, want to wish a happy belated birthday to Colonel Roman online. Hope you had a nice day yesterday. Um, it's nice being here. It's been a busy summer. Um, I missed the last governing board meeting, but didn't want to skip an opportunity to um, express my gratitude to you guys and the farmers in the EAA for their phosphorus reductions that came out this summer. Um, another landmark year for them in the EAA with the 63% phosphorus reduction. You guys have heard me speak on this before, but these reductions are not attained accidentally. They're science-based best management practices that our farmers and ranchers all across the state are doing. North and south of the lake, inside and outside BMAPs, we've got farmers and ranchers implementing science-based best management practices um, and providing a whole host of other benefits for, for everybody in the state of Florida. Um, it's been a busy summer, last couple weeks, county coalition last week, one of my favorite meetings of the year, always great discussion to be had, and the barbecue is always on point. Blue Green Algae Task Force workshop earlier this week and the hybrid meeting here next week, and the NEEP workshop here next week. Um, encouraged by some of the numbers that I saw looking into the NEEP, NEEP um, documents earlier this week with 82% of our IVs being completed. Um, another great example of FDACs and our farmers and ranchers working together to reduce water use and improve water quality. Um, so we're excited as farmers and ranchers to be at the table for all these meetings that are ongoing. Seems like the summer was supposed to be a time to slow down, but it never happens that way. So again, we're, we're as farmers and ranchers happy to be here, happy to be a seat at the table, helping provide a, another tool in the toolbox, as our friends like to say. Um, so thanks again. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Foytick. We'll move next to our virtual participants, Mark Perry, followed by Scott Martin. Mr. Perry, please unmute. Yes, uh, hopefully you can hear me, Governing Board. Uh, good afternoon. Um, just wanted to kind of make a general comment on, on NEEP, the Northern Everglades and Estuaries Protection Program. Um, since recently, you've had it um, tied to the agenda at the end, the kind of two fact sheets that are that are talking about NEEP and also the uh, Corps of Engineers updates on all their projects. I think these are excellent, uh, excellent pieces to look at and, and kind of get updates on. Um, you know, updates on uh, NEEP are really important, and I'm glad we're having that annual public workshop that's put together for the 20 private public partnership that's uh, going on on land in the Upper Kissimmee subwatershed. Uh, this is really an important example of how we can work together with private interests in the watershed, uh, north of the lake particularly, in, in these detention areas in order to have storage and treatment uh, done at the in the subwatershed. Um, the water quality benefits to that um, 3,000 acre uh, storage benefit are not just the water storage and attenuation of the flows to the Kissimmee, but also the 0.4 metric tons of total phosphorus and 5.2 metric tons of total nitrogen. It would be nice to see that benefit actually occur. And those estimated benefits could be monitored because the district has uh, hundreds of monitoring stations in each of these sub watersheds and able to realize how, how effective these projects are gonna be. So I encourage the district and the governing board, as you've requested before, well, how are we doing with BMAP implementation or BMP implementation? Are we really getting these reductions in phosphorus, nitrogen, and other nutrient reduction, as well as flow attenuation out of these projects in the BMAPs or in, in BMPs? So I encourage you to kind of keep track of that and keep looking on it. 
Um, you know, the district is kind of the lead agency in my out of the three in my mind because not just the monitoring, but you uh, kind of handle all the watershed protection plans, which are key to how we pull all this together and try to protect the watersheds um, from uh, conveying this pollution to the downstream receiving bodies, whether they be the lake, the Everglades, or the estuaries. So thanks very much for uh, including that. And as we go forward, we're advocating for doing everything we can in these watersheds and updating these B maps. We look forward to continue to uh, work with that and with the district and the other agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Next, we'll hear from Scott Martin, followed by Ryan Rossi. Mr. Martin, please unmute your mic. Mr. Martin, we, we can't hear you. How about now? Yes, we can hear you now, Mr. Martin. So sorry about that. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Scott Martin, Anglers for Lake Okeechobee. Um, pretty, pretty awesome to hear about all the great projects that are going on north, east, west, and south of, of the lake here. Drew, hats off to you and South Florida Water Management and all the great success that you guys continue to have with these projects. These STAs really do an amazing amount of work uh, and, and, and really improve the water quality so much. Uh, the one thing, though, that I would, I would ask the board, uh, I know there's a lot of very smart people in this room right now. These projects are all well thought out and planned. Um, but it does, it does raise a question, why, why aren't we considering some projects inside the lake uh, and specifically submerged vegetation? There is hundreds of millions of dollars being spent all around the lake to deal with the water coming out of the lake. But yet, I don't hear of any projects or any funding, for that matter, for, for projects inside the lake. And so I'm asking the board, I'm asking the governor, I'm asking the FWC, I'm asking everybody that's in this, in this room to support aquatic vegetation rehabilitation in Lake Okeechobee. Um, it's super important for us. We, 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 for years, you know, Newton talks about duck season and opening up in a few days. Ducks are a thing in the past on Lake Okeechobee. We used to have a, a very healthy population of waterfowl that came and visited Lake Okeechobee every single year. But since we have virtually zero submerged vegetation, we have no food for them. Uh, we, we have very little food for our, our fish and our aquatic, uh, aquatic uh, species. The manatees are suffering. Um, I feel bad for the manatees floating around out there in a dirty, in a dirty lake. Uh, they're, they're, used to, they're used to clean, clear water. So I just ask everyone in this meeting, the board especially, uh, Drew, South Water Management, everybody, let's, let's start putting some projects on the, board, on the books immediately, some funding. We need, we need $100 million for Lake Okeechobee inside the lake. There's work to be done on Lake Okeechobee that will dramatically improve the water quality in the lake, allow the lake to filter its own water, but thus will give us, our small communities around the lake, these businesses that depend on Lake Okeechobee, the bass, the ducks, and the wildlife, it'll give them a chance. We're dying over here. Uh, as great as these projects are, east, west, north, and south, we have to have immediately funding for Lake Okeechobee and some plans put forward to help the vegetation and create habitat in Lake Okeechobee. We have lots of acreage, Moonshine Bay, the Ten House Cove area, where we can get in with a little bit of money. We can open up some of those marshes, let the lake breathe a little bit, and open up some fantastic fishing opportunities. There's thousands of people that enjoy this lake and thousands of people that live on this lake that depend on it every single day. So as much as we need these projects, east, west, north, and south, we have to put funding in Lake Okeechobee and rebuild the habitat. We're dying without it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Next, we'll hear from Ryan Rossi. Mr. Rossi, please unmute your mic. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you. Okay, great. Uh, Ryan Rossi, South Florida Water Coalition. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I just want to take a minute actually to thank the South Florida Water Management District um, for establishing a tidal outlook forecast in an effort to create awareness to king tides. I saw the email uh, that you guys sent out recently. I, I think that this kind of initiative is actually incredibly useful uh, to residents, especially those who live you know, here in our coastal communities, obviously, and along A1A and, and the Barrier Islands. <clears throat> 
I know that we often see mention of king tides in, in the local media, but it always seems to be during or after they're, they're occurring. So to have dates um, published and information on what to anticipate, I think is very useful, uh, especially when these events coincide with some of the heavier rainfall we get that make flooding incredibly problematic for residents. And on a related note, it was also good to hear that some funding is coming in for flood control, and hopefully that helps address some of the water quality issues I think that uh, we frequently experience as a result. Um, so that's all. Uh, thank you again for the commitment to the public on this. And I know for me, I'll be encouraging folks to be aware and, and follow along with uh, what you guys put out about it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. Mr. Chairman, we have no additional public comment on this item. Great. Thank you, Molly. And thank you all very much for your comments. We're going to move now to board comments. And I'll start uh, on my left with Mr. Butler. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we'll say it again this afternoon, but thank you to all the staff that have put together the budget and, and have everything teed up for us later on today. Um, <laughs> Drew, that's a big list. Um, let's make sure we get them all checked off, by the way. Um, the um, 2 o'clock start time, I like it. I think we'll get a lot of work done this morning. Uh, you know, <laughs> we get more meetings like this, I wouldn't mind. That's my vote. Um, I had to get that out there. Um, couple things um i uh, had a chance last month you know i think uh newton mentioned we dodged a bullet i had a chance last month uh spent a little time at crystal river about three days before idalia swung by and um in fact saw some pictures from up there uh the same hotel i stayed at was uh about four foot of water up in the hotel so uh uh chauncey it's nothing unfortunately nothing new for you but uh, but that, that again that further hit home for me. But uh, but got to look at some of the seagrass recovery strategies that they've done up there in that Crystal River Nature Coast area with their aquatic preserve. That is uh, that's worth looking at. I sure hope that uh, sure hope we can get some of that. Whatever it took to make that happen, it would be neat to see that on east on our east and west coast. And I know that there's a big push to make that happen. But um, but that was neat to see. Um, Lower Kissimmee Basin, STA, um, I think we've received, as a governing board, we've received a letter or two from Okeechobee County. Um, Okeechobee County had requested a, um, uh, they wanted a presentation from the district and EIP, an update on what was going on with that STA, and, uh, and also requested a couple uh, uh, local basin uh, uh, stakeholder meetings, and, um, and EIP made that happen. Uh, so I want to say thank you to EIP. Um, thank you to staff for for uh, for getting all that, also getting those presentations done. Um, the um, some of the comments that have come out um, of those stakeholder meetings, county commission meetings, and even the 16 uh, county coalition meeting, um, two major concerns are, are coming to the forefront. There, um, one is is a question of you know, with this STA going in, neighboring some development, um, and some of those homes in these developments were there pre-1991, uh, pre, um, uh, pre-change in building code and floor, finished floor elevation requirements and that kind of thing. There's some, some flooding type concerns and what impact uh, property insurance may have or even flood insurance. I think flood insurance, from my perspective, is, a, uh, is probably one of the more valid concerns if there is an issue. Um, so EIP has committed in that one to um, uh, go ahead and get a determination from FEMA on any impact to the uh, to the flood maps, whether it be with the uh, flood zone locations, type of flood zone, base flood elevation, that kind of thing. Um, so um, look forward to seeing the results of that. Um, but uh, and then the second major issue that's that's been brought up by the county and by locals is you know, we talk about STAs, Newton talks about STAs and duck hunting. Well, the STAs traditionally bring in birds, and there is a concern with uh, the Okeechobee County Airport, the public airport, um, uh, being within a five-mile proximity to the STA, uh, the, the, the approach to the runway. Um, in addition, the two communities that, uh, that surround this STA, each of them have an airstrip, a private airstrip. And uh, so there are concerns when it, as it relates to bird strikes and what impact that may be. Um, again, EIP is committed to uh, uh, going ahead and, you know, 
getting with the FAA at some point in the process here, uh, that, 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 that point would be triggered um, where FFA, FAA would, uh, would look at the issue, but, um, but I look forward to seeing those results also um, and seeing what potential impact. Other concerns, you know, certainly mosquitoes, alligators, other type of things that uh, uh, may be coming on, construction traffic noise, cost of the project, uh, those were kind of a, a summary of concerns that were brought up through that, through that deal. Uh, ultimately, Okeechobee County, they say it's a good project. They just say it's in the wrong location. Um, but we'll see as this process, we'll see what EIP is already committed to making some, um, have indicated they're making some improvements based on the, uh, based on the critiques. So I just wanted to give you all that update. Um, I've been trying to stay engaged with that one. Um, glad to see the neat meeting on the agenda for next week. Um, again, that was as part of those stakeholder meetings. Um, we can't have enough public outreach and discussion when it comes to water quality. Um, or really, all of our environmental issues, in this case, the water quality issue, uh, I think one of the stakeholder meetings, um, Drew and I had just kind of heard enough. Both of us had the Holy Spirit hit us at the same time and stood, jumped to the front of the room and took the meeting over. Drew beat me to it. Drew got to lead the discussion. But just kind of updating, bringing people up to speed really on kind of what the water quality issues are. Um, still, I mean, it's, it's, we're, we're in a bubble here. We all kind of get it. We all see it. Everybody in this room knows the issues that are going on outside of this room, maybe not so much. And, uh, but meetings like what you're having next week, uh, I'm appreciative of, and hopefully we can get some, get some people to attend, pay attention and, uh, and begin to keep an eye on what's going on. Um, it was mentioned earlier, but also I want to thank the Parton family. Uh, that was in our NEEP update for this month. Uh, thank them for their partnership with the district, water storage up in Osceola County, an area where we greatly need the water storage. And uh, 3,000 acre partial, over 4,000 acre feet of storage with some nutrient removal. Um, thank you for the partners for stepping up and providing, uh, providing that service to the public. And then I got to meet with New Quadic this month. Uh, New Quadic is the new company, the predecessor, or they're the new company, their predecessor was Phosphory, I'm not sure, was it Phosphory? Okay, Phosphory, uh, they've got a project going on that we approved last, last year. I don't know if it was May or April or something like that, but uh, maybe May. But a nutrient removal project on the S191. Um, they're gonna start slinging, slinging water and pulling nutrients out next month. So um, I look forward to seeing the results on that. But uh, uh, kind of a little bit of an update. I think that's everything I had on my list there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Ms. Meads. Chairman, I don't have an opening statement. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Steinle. Um, ben, thanks for that update. And, and thanks for sort of taking lead on uh, that project and, and uh, interacting um, with the stakeholders up there. I, I, I mean, I, what I've been interested to, to hear and continue to stay updated on is whether um, it's just a lack, you know, it's just, it's, a, it, it's limited information that people have had so far to, so, uh, so, I'm, so I'm happy to hear that the items seem to be resolvable um, with, some, with some work um, because, you know, from as we discussed in the last meeting, this is a region, an area that desperately needs this type of project. Uh, and we all know that finding sufficient land that is all, you know, uh, uh, connected um, is, is hard. So um, thanks for taking the lead on that. And then the only other thing is I wanted to thank Drew and thank staff. I mean, I've, I feel like we've, you've accomplished an enormous amount in the past four and a half years, large, massive projects, as well as uh, more modestly sized ones. But when I hear about, I didn't know we had that much more to do, <laughs> or or the funding to do it. But so when I hear about that that impressive list of projects, um, I'm I'm joking. I know we have a ton to do, but when I hear about that impressive list of projects, um, and uh, 
and that there's support, financial support for it. It's just, uh, it, makes me, it makes me feel proud of the work that you guys do. Um, so uh, thank you all for that. Thanks, Mr. Steinle. Uh, Vice Chair Wagner. We'll come back to you, Mr. Bergeron, if you have any comments. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Yeah, thank you. First, I want to thank my fellow board members, as always. It's an honor to sit with you. And certainly our staff, uh, just can't say enough about our staff and, and all of our stakeholders. And, uh, and I do want to thank Drew and our staff for moving forward and moving water south and, and completing the plan to uh, uh, put our culverts in the L-28, move more water south, uh, and also uh, the seepage wall, which is allowing us to continue the first stage of modified water delivery uh, year-round because of the seepage wall that, uh, that we have built. And, and those are uh, very great accomplishments also want to recognize the, the progress that we're making. Over 60 projects uh, started, completed uh, under the leadership of our governor and legislators. Uh, it, it's really appalling to me of how we are moving so quickly to save one of the natural wonders of the world. And I also want to say the, the Python Challenge, uh, which uh, uh, our professional hunters, along with FWC, are the best in the world. Uh, we have over 1,000 participants in the Python Challenge. Tomorrow we'll be giving out awards to all of the, the winners of the largest uh, Python caught and the most caught. Uh, extremely important to the food chain. And without a healthy food chain, we cannot have a healthy environment. So uh, I'm very honored to be there tomorrow and look forward to seeing Drew and our whole team. And long live the Everglades. Hey, thank you, Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Martinez. No comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Colonel Roman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, First of all, I, I want to echo some of the comments by my fellow board members and thank Drew and the entire district team for their incredible work and the success that we've been able to achieve uh, over the past four and a half years. I'd like to give a shout out to Akeen Owosana um, for his 25 years serving the district. Boy, are we lucky to have him and, and his talents on the district uh, team and also congratulate the Lower West Coast Hydrogeology Update Team. You know, that you can barely say what their title is. And these folks work in such uh, rarefied air and put it all together and explain it to us mere mortals. So uh, I just really, really appreciate the great work uh, that they're doing and they'll continue to do. And I think the recognition was warranted today. And I wanted to say thank you. Uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to Carolina Moran. Her efforts with getting grant money for the district is just beginning. I see great things as we continue to snag the dollars in order to upgrade our systems for resiliency. And finally, the budget team. Uh, I, just, I just can't say enough about Candy and her entire budget team who works tirelessly every year going through the same thing for us. And it's just so much work, I, I can barely put my arms around it and understand it, how many deadlines and requirements that they have throughout the process. So thank you, hats off. I know eventually at the end of this month, she'll be very happy to put this one to bed. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Colonel Roman. Uh, Vice Chair Wagner, if you're available and like to make a comment. Sorry about that, Chauncey. I'm here. I have no comment today. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. 
Um, I'll wrap up and I want to echo what Mr. Steinle said in uh, regards to Mr. Butler, your involvement. Um, I know it's your backyard and I know it's contentious and I really appreciate the fact that you're, you're hanging in there for us and I really appreciate the update. It, it sounds like it's going in the right direction. It sounds like EIP is doing what it should be doing, which is listening to the people who, who live and it's going to impact. And I, I don't think anything is intractable and I, I hope we can... We can see some good progress there. Um, I'd like to also thank the uh, the LBC and our legislature for making sure that we've got some of the funds we need to keep moving. Uh, we, we've got a lot to do, as uh, Drew, Drew explained, and um, some of that money is this year money, not next year money, so we're really happy to have that. And I'd like to thank our friends in the DEP also, because I know that they were very, very instrumental in helping with that and, and working through uh, the, the gates at Tallahassee, as it were. Um, I'd also like to thank our, our staff who works on hurricanes. And I know there isn't a staff that work on hurricanes, but I do know it's hurricane season and it's incredibly disruptive. And you know everyone sort of drops everything and goes into hurricane mode every time there's a hurricane floating around out there. So I, I just want to say thank you uh, as, a, as a resident um, and for the residents because it's, it's a lot of work and you, you work very hard to uh, keep us all safe. And, and we appreciate that. And hopefully we don't have to do it anymore. But in, in the off chance we do, thank you. Um, the Python Challenge um, is wrapped up, and Mr. Bergeron, thanks very much for, uh, for, for going tomorrow with uh, Drew. And uh, you said we had 1,000 participants, and you're going to be you're thanking some winners. And I, I say the real winners in this thing are the residents of South Florida. I don't know how many pythons were taken out, but I, I do know I'm sure it was a lot. And I can't thank you enough for, for uh, helping with that and organize that. It's, just, it's a great event. Um, I'm also glad to hear about the uh, herbicide reduction um, that Drew talked about and when we're talking about exotic removal. I, I think that's really important that we keep focused on that. It's easy not to. It's easy to just stay focused on exotic removal, but I think uh, staying focused on the herbicide reduction part of that is, is really important, and I, I, I appreciate that uh, very much. Um, and the budget crew, uh, hats off to you, Candy, and all your team. It's, uh, it's amazing what you do, and uh, you make our lives a lot easier by, by the work you put in. Um, now we'll move to um, consent, and if there are any board members who want to move any items to the consent agenda, to, from the consent to discussion, uh, let me know. Okay, hearing none, we'll go to public comment on consent. We have none, Mr. Chairman. Um, great. Uh, board members, the uh, consent agenda 13 requires a two-thirds majority vote. Uh, can I have a motion and a second to approve consent? Move to approve consent agenda. I have a motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? If not, I'll call the question and start with Mr. Steinley. Yes. I'll vote yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Vice Chair Wagner? Yes. Mr. Bergeron? We'll come back to Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Thank you. Colonel Roman? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Thank you. That passes unanimously. We can go now to uh, discussion. And we'll talk about the C-43. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and fellow board members. I'll be providing an update today on construction project progress on the C-43 Caloosahatchee Reservoir, uh, basically between the months of May through today and the progress we've made. So um, this project has been a multi-phase project, um, but the benefits of this project that come out of comprehensive Everglades restoration um, are many. Uh, this is located in Hendry County, and it includes capturing excess basin water, um, releases from uh, excess and releases from Lake Okeechobee, improving salinity balance in the estuary, and this is done by capturing peak flows during the wet season, and providing essential flows during the dry season. This is a site map of, of the project, and it's been completed over multiple packages, so packages one through three over time, and then package four most recently. But this site is a, is a two-cell reservoir that covers over 10,500 500 acres, which is about 10,000 football fields. And this stores 170,000 acre feet of water from the Caloosahatchee River. Package one was an embankment preloading uh, project at six critical structures around the dam and included demolition of existing ag infrastructure. This work is complete. 
Package two is the S-476 pump station, which replaces the original irrigation pump station located on the header canal, uh, shown here. This is the header canal. Uh, that supplied water to existing water users in the area. The reservoir was built over this canal, and the new pump station reroutes that water around the reservoir through the new perimeter canal. This work is complete with this contractor. Package three, S470, is our inflow pump station. Uh, 1,500 CFS, was, which is equivalent to one billion gallons per day, which pulls water from the Caloosahatchee River through the Townsend Canal to the reservoir. And this contractor is complete with its work. Package four is the reservoir construction, which includes 19 miles of dam embankment, includes 15 miles of perimeter canal, 14 water control structures, one pump station, Recreation features that include boat ramps and equestrian access around the perimeter road. Towns and canal improvements, including dredging and hardening of the canal slopes, and three local and site access bridges around the site. The embankment is on average 33 feet on, in height, and water is stored up to 22 feet deep, again on average. And there is a 10-foot drop across the site from the southeast to the northwest corner. So uh, at, in April 28th, we terminated the contract with our contractor and started work. And this, um, I'll be going through showing you images of when we terminated and the work progress to date. So the Banana Branch Canal, shown here in the blue, runs through this site. It originally originally flows through the site and provides stormwater discharge from the south to the north and out to the river. The southern portion of this banana branch is also called the Roberts Canal, so it has two names. The reservoir designed and interrupted that flow and reroutes it through the perimeter canal. Stru the structure complex, S481, A, B, and C, uh, and controls water in three different directions. A moves water to the west at 150 CFS, B moves water north in a adjacent ditch to the banana, banana Branch Canal at 50 CFS, and C moves flow into the Banana Branch Canal at 250 CFS. So flows in this canal needed to be maintained throughout the project, and so that canal remained open and the embankment did not, did not meet in that section because we needed to provide flood protection. Mm -hmm. So at, you can see here the three structures, it's very hard to see, but the three structures are constructed. Um, and uh, perimeter canal was complete. This, this shows embankment foundation preparation had not yet started, but the 481 structures, structures were complete at the end of April. So one month later, the foundation prep preparation activities are underway. This picture shows the backfilling of the Banana Branch Canal here. And then three and a half months later, the foundation prep is complete. The new dam section is in construction. You can see where the dam, what, dam stopped and where the canal continued through here. So that is now where we're at. Um, and the perimeter canal is completely routed around the reservoir at this time, which is a big deal. So 479 has a similar uh, purpose. It's a combined pump station and stormwater discharge structure. It lifts water from the header canal that I had mentioned along here. So it's, it's 125 CFS capacity and it also moves stormwater discharge. Um, in this picture, the foundation of the embankment is still incomplete. Embankment work has not yet started and the perimeter canal is not yet connected. So two months later, we have the embankment foundation is complete. The perimeter canal has been connected, which allows that flow through the canal for stormwater discharges to the east, and then as well as to the S481 Banana Branch Complex. So this next, uh, this is the S476 pump station. Uh, 
It, re it replaced the original irrigation pump station located on the header canal that supplied water to existing water users. It provides 195 CFS of flow. And the reservoir, again, was built over this header canal. And the new pump station reroutes that water around the reservoir. So the terminus of the, the perimeter canal actually starts at 476 here and then goes south and around to, all the way to the north. So this picture shows a temporary bypass pipe that was installed. And this allowed, this allowed water to come in the 476 and then into a, a canal that was dug and connected into the header canal. And then the water was moved off and across the site. And again, at the 479 location, that was left open as well. So during construction, we had unimpeded flow. So uh, this temporary bypass pipe, though, actually in, uh, conflicted with the embankment construction. So we removed the pipe two months later and did the first phase of the dam construction. The next phase is the phase two lift with the cutoff wall and then another seven feet on top for fill. And the S476 is to the right here on the photograph. And so the connection two months after in, in August, um, shows that we've connected to that perimeter canal and we're discharging and moving water. So the perimeter canal is now fully connected. That's a big deal. So the next structure is the S-471. This is one of our uh, discharge structures out of the reservoir. This is from cell one. It has a design flow of 450 CFS. This shows the foundation starting in a checkerboard pattern with the northern half of the structure being prepared for structure foundation concrete pour. Four months later, the foundation is 90% poured. Walls are being erected. You can see on the sides here. And the gate framing is underway. And this shows the same structure, intake walls being formed, site Personnel were working on tying that reinforcement. We're looking south into cell one right now. You can see all the, the heavy equipment, big iron and staff and cranes on site. And then we pan around and we can see the structure from the side as well as the inflow pump station and communication tower in the background here. So a big part of building a reservoir, you know you're heading to completion when you start put, seeing the soil cement on the interior face. The reservoir requires soil cement to protect from wave erosion. And um, previous, you can see here, this is a previous contractor's soil cement batch plant, averaging about 90 linear feet per day. And this is, uh, this is the new contractor that's on site. The new batch plant has a higher capacity than the previous operation, which includes six silos versus three for storage of cement for each batch plant. The batch plants are gonna be uh, installed strategically around the site, and we will be doing both cells at the same time to gain time. So, we are looking for a proof of concept in October, and once that's passed or that's found satisfactory, we'll be moving forward to production. And the contractor is estimating 15 months to complete, and we're looking, looking to complete the soil cement, we're estimating by December 2024. So the S-475 is the divide structure that moves water between cells one and two has a 750 CFS design flow capacity. This construction was dormant and allowed to flood, so no dewatering on site. Um, the constructed features at this time included foundation, walls, and gate framing. And within a few months, this work resumed, or a few months later, the, the work resumed, the operating platform is underway, and the structure is actually nearing completion. 
We're working with a gate manufacturer to finalize fabrication details and deliver gates to the site for installation. So we're making a lot of headway there. So you can see we've made progress. Um, we're super happy about that. Um, here's the overall construction status, status of the site, including the packages one, two, and three that were previously complete. And then in regards to the reservoir itself, to date we've completed, completed 18 of the 19 miles of embankment, 10 of the 15 miles of perimeter canal, seven of the 14 water control structures, 85% of that S-479 pump station structure, and we were 80% 80, 80 complete on the three bridges. So on the right, you'll see a picture. It's at night. We do concrete pours, or I should say early morning. We do concrete pours in the early morning to take advantage of weather and cooler temperatures for concrete placement. Everybody knows Florida is super hot. So uh, we are driving the project to finish as early as possible, and we want to get the facility in operation before the wet season of 2025. So I've walked you through some key structures and their status. We wanted to make sure you also had a first-hand view of what's going on at the site. So we sent staff out last Friday to get the live action of what's happening on the ground. We have heavy equipment working on the northern embankment in the northeast corner of the project. S-475 divide structure that I mentioned is under construction, provides the ability to move water between the cells, the concrete pour for the structure walls, and here's work on the gate operating platform. So S-474 outflow structure under construction moves water out of cell two to the perimeter canal and out to the Townsend and Caloosahatchee. Concrete pours for the structure walls are ongoing. Construction workers are busy at the S-471 outflow structure, which discharges water from cell one, similar to 474. They are working on rebar, framing for concrete pours, cleanup of the mud in the structure, being lifted out by hopper and crane. Here's an aerial view of the work. And this is looking at the northwest corner of 43. We're moving east along the northern embankment towards 471. You can see the structures have to be tied into the embankment. So we're moving west along the northern embankment here towards the inflow pump station. Um, this pulls water from the Caloosahatchee through the Townsend, like I mentioned. You can see the Townsend is where this tree line is here. So in the final pieces of the pump station are to bring, to bring water into the reservoir or to excavate and open this, connect the canal, the intake canal to the Townsend, and then to construct the discharge pipes on the embankment, which required the embankment to be in place for us to do that work. So and to continue our progress on this project, we are seeking governing board approval for additional budgetary authority and the amount of $104.5 million to complete this important restoration project. Oh, thanks very much. Um, we'll go to public comment on this and then we'll come back for board comment. Yes, we have one. We'll hear from Caitlin Newcamp, Ms. Newcamp. Good afternoon, Governing Board members. Caitlin Newcamp with Audubon, Florida. <clears throat> Since its inception, Audubon has supported and worked for the effective planning and construction of the C-43 West Basin Storage Reservoir. It is a crucial part of restoring the dry season salinity in the Caloosahatchee, as well as it will help secure consistent flows to the Caloosahatchee, especially in times when it is needed the most. Um, like she said, this 170 thousand acre feet facility will provide a significant part of the water storage needed for the basin, reduce algal bloom inducing harmful discharges, and benefit uh, downstream communities. We are glad to see this project is back on track, especially with the recent challenges. Um, and so we want to just thank the district for your efforts to make this possible. 
um, and now with a projected um, lower cost as well. So uh, just in addition, we wanted to advocate for additional um, water storage options such as an ad adjacent STA or natural filter solutions to target the nitrogen pollution specifically. We asked the district to continue having these conversations to meet the Caloosahatchee Nitrogen TMDL. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Newcamp. We do have another on Zoom. Mr. DeLisi, would you please unmute your mic? Uh, thank you. Um, I assume you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well, so thank you so much for this project, uh, keeping it moving forward. Thank you. I believe it was Lucene who was doing that presentation. Incredibly informative. Um, I, I'd be lying to you if I didn't, if, if I pretended that I wasn't very nervous when the um, uh, when the defunction, I'll call it that, to the contractor uh, occurred. Uh, you know, the delays are something we, we just can't afford in the police statute. Um, so uh, keeping this on track uh, or keeping it moving faster than it otherwise would have been moving uh, is, is what it appears to be. Um, is It's just uh, an amazing amount of work. So uh, Mitnick, to you and your team, uh, you guys are doing a fantastic job. And I hope this keeps moving forward because we desperately need it on the first half of the time. Thank you, Mr. DeLisi. Mr. Chairman, we have no additional public comments on this item. Thanks. Is there any board comment on this? Mr. Stanley. I, I want to um, thank, congratulate staff for the, for the progress. I mean, this is, this is amazing. I, that, that was great to see the before and after um, progress pictures. It really is telling. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm fully supportive of the uh, resolution. Uh, I think it represents about, if, I'm, if my math is right, about 15% of the total cost. Um, so, you know, as I'm sure you would anyways, I would just ask that you keep us updated on the progress and the spends of that. And, you know, could we legally give staff a bonus if you came in a lot under that? <laughs> I don't think so. But anyways, let's try to come in. Let's try to come in a lot, a lot under that. That was a joke, Mary Cruz. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Steinle. Um, I, th that presentation was both really, really encouraging and really, really infuriating because the infuriating part is you did all that in four months. You know, what, what would have happened if we hadn't done what we did? So I, I just, I thank you all for, for taking the reins on this. It's, I know it's not easy. Um, I think, and I think I'm on the record of saying this, that it's something that as we move forward, we might want to take another look at and see what lessons we can learn from this project and probably also the C44 as we go into these big projects to see if, if our staff can't do some of these things, save some money and move things along more quickly. And I know that you're probably going, oh, no, no, don't say that. But, but I think that there is, um, I, I think it's probably something that we should explore further um, as we move forward. And, you know, we can, we can't do bonuses, but we can do coffee and donuts or whatever. But, uh, and I, I, I will also say as a resident of, of Southwest Florida, um, your, your commitment to this is, um, it, is really appreciated. And it, it would have been so easy to just say, oh gosh, they, they were running slow on it and we're just gonna go slow too and we'll never get this done. But you haven't, you've, you've actually accelerated um, the project from what it was and that, that it, I'm very appreciative of. And I know that folks in, in Southwest Florida are as well. So thank you. I'm, I, the, the 1045, which sounds like a radio station, is, um, that's budget authority, correct? So it, you, you know, that's sort of not to exceed, and hopefully you're not coming back to us anymore. And if you come in under, great. Um, if there's no further discussion. Uh, I just had one thing to yeah. say. It's beautiful, right? It, what a great presentation. So we've all been there and it's a great site, and a beautiful site. And we remember what it looked like when we were there. And I got to fly over it in a helicopter and, and look at each corner and to see how much is done. It's, this presentation is <coughs> excellent. You know, it makes my heart sing. Thank you. You want to make a motion? I move to approve. I'll second. No, Mr. Mr. Chair. 
Chauncey, I think Ron Bergeron has his hand up. Oh, thank you. I can't see that. I have a motion and a second, and I'm going to take Mr. Bergeron for discussion. Go ahead, Ms. Bergeron. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? I can. Okay. Thank you. I, I just want to compliment our staff. Uh, you know, I'm an engineering construction contractor for 58 years, and it just shows you the talent uh, that we have uh, within uh, our organization to take over such a project and and to bring it to completion. And this project is so important to the Caloosahatchee and the estuaries and the Gulf and the Atlantic. And I just have one question about, based upon the schedule we're on today, uh, do we have a a schedule that shows an approximate uh, completion time on this project? Uh, that's still being worked out. I think right now, Mr. Bergeron, we're confident we can get it ready for the wet season of 25. Okay. Well, thank you and, and congratulations on uh, picking, the, picking this project up and um, moving it forward very quickly. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? I will, will say one thing, which just, just dawned on me. You, you did all that work during the wet season. So that, that's amazing. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you do in the dry season. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, we'll go ahead and call that question. Uh, Mr. Steinley. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Meads. Yes. Mr. Butler. Yes. I'm going to vote yes. Uh, Vice Chair. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Martinez. Uh, I'm going to vote yes and, and just, again, echo what, what everybody else has said, uh, Mr. Chair, about our staff uh, from the top all the way down, what they have been able to do. Uh, I, like like Ron, I'm, I'm in the industry, and it is mind-boggling um, and, and cannot be said and they cannot be complimented enough what what they have done and what they and, and the work that they have in front of them, by the way. Um, so uh, that's an absolute and resounding yes. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Thank you. Colonel Roman. I'm going to vote yes, and I want to thank the staff for getting this very important project on track again. Thank you. Well, thank you. That passes unanimously. And we'll move now to uh, technical reports with Mr. Mitnick. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and board members. Looks like it's about uh, 3.30, if I'm not mistaken. Heard the chair said you can't start early, can't start late on the budget meeting. So, Lawrence, it's up to you and I to drag this out for 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. All right, but Molly, if I'm standing here in 10 minutes, turn off the slides. So, looking back. Um, rainfall the past couple of months, uh, July and August have been just slightly below average. Um, so far, September is still playing out. Um, you'll see on the next slide that we're also slightly below average so far for the month of September, but it's a stark contrast to last year's September over here. Of course, that was Hurricane Ian. Um, we have not yet hit the peak of hurricane season, so hopefully we'll get past that peak with out any additional events or drama this year. Um, so we'll see how it plays out for the rest of the month. But overall, um, looking back at August, um, was slightly below normal there at the 89%. Um, it was just the, the central portion of the water management, just south central portion of the water management district that had the majority of the rains right in through here. Lower west coast is still um, the loss leader, so to speak, in the largest deficits. Um, but um, the upper Kissimmee there also had um, some below average rainfalls as well. So what is that has done to the lake system up in the upper chain, as I've talked about the past two months, um, we're sort of letting East Lake and West Lake um, rise up to their schedules with the passage of Adalia. Um, they sort of, you can see how they rose, they got up to their schedules, we started moving water out of all the lakes in the upper chain up here in response to some of that direct rainfall as the storm passed the west coast. 
I'm trying to maintain them on their regulation schedule. So you can see the accumulated effect over here in Lake Kissimmee, how it came up and it hit its schedule. We did a very good job, I would say, of um, retaining a lot of that water in Lake Kissimmee and allowing it to get up to its regulation schedule. I think last month when I presented, there was some discussion of potential concern that Lake Kissimmee wouldn't get up to its schedule. And then what would that mean for the following dry season for river flows coming down the restored reaches of the Kissimmee River? So it's gotten up at least to its schedule for this time of year, but the schedule keeps on rising until it gets up to its winter pool up here in November. So um, hopefully it'll continue to rise and we'll let it follow up to its winter pool as we move forward in time. So this slide looks different than you've seen in the past. Um, so over here on the left-hand side of the slide, this graphic is what you're used to seeing every month for the last couple of years. It is our standard um, position analysis, modeling projections of what the likelihood of Lake Okeechobee water levels as we move forward in time, um, given the current existing Lake Okeechobee regulation schedule. Um, which is LORS 2008. So every week, as you know, the Water Management District makes a weekly recommendation to the Corps of Engineers for their consideration on how they should go about managing Lake Okeechobee. All of our recommendations up till now and will continue in the future as long as LORS 2008 is the authorized lake regulation schedule. All of our weekly recommendations will be consistent with LORS 2008 and the operational flexibility that are contained within LORS 2008. However, a couple months back, I think it was one of the board members had asked a question on this slide in a, in a prior presentation of kind of what would lake levels look like under the proposed Lake Okeechobee system operating manual, because this was back during a time when there was a lot of debate and discussion over um, what that plan would look like. So your staff was able to put together and recode some of the model inputs in the two by two model. This is the South Florida water management model, otherwise known as the two by two. Recode some of those inputs um, to reflect the July 2023 water control plan as it was being proposed by the Corps of Engineers through their planning process. For anybody that's in touch with that planning process, you'll more affectionately know it as the PA25 modeling run. Um, so this is a provisional tool. It's still under development and will still go through further refinements. Um, both by our staff and we'll be working with the Corps of Engineers to further refine this tool as they work to finalize the authorization for what whatever will be the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual. But in the meantime, this is kind of what that projection would look like. So just changing the regulation schedule from LORS 2008 over to what was described in the July 23rd water control plan. This is kind of what you get for lake levels as we move out into the future. And I'll, I can see some of you are intently studying the screen. <laughs> so I'll pause for a second or two before moving on. <laughs> Thank you all for putting this together. This is, I've, I've wondered what it would look like. So I appreciate that. And that's, you know, realize this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but it's yeah. good to kind of, it, it for me, it helps me to kind of benchmark what we're seeing today and what, you know, what, how things work under lower versus what it could be under low sums. So no, I appreciate that. Thank you. John, yes, could sir. you do me a favor and just trace the P50 line in both? Because I think I know which ones they are, but I, okay. on this side, it's yep. this red line that comes through. Thanks. And on lowers, it's this red line gotcha. that comes through. Thank you. So yeah, as I said, it's provisional, still in draft form, still subject to further refinement and review, and all of our recommendations will continue to be on the existing authorized schedule over here in LORS 2008. So just, that, sorry, John. Yes, sir. I, I just want to make sure. I'm, so on the on that page, okay. The the um, the the uh, what to call it? The the probabilities don't change between the graphs. They're they're exactly the same. It's just the yeah. Okay. Correct. Where they. And by line the way, up. does that. I don't know if this is a formal coding system, but does that address your ongoing, um, which I agree with, issue on high, inner, low? <laughs> it is even, it's less descriptive. 
You'll notice down here on the legend there is no low band. <laughs> yeah. All right. So where's water moved um, since the start of this wet season? You can see we've had just short of 800,000 acre feet have come into Lake Okeechobee um, since May 1st in the beginning of this uh, water year. Over here on the west coast, there's been just shy of 650,000 acre feet have moved to the Clusatchee Estuary with roughly 110,000 acre feet having originated back in Lake Okeechobee. For the east coast and the St. Lucie Estuary, there's been about 8,000 acre feet have come from basin runoff to the St. Lucie Estuary combined with a, just over 100,000 acre feet of runoff from C2324 basins and then just a little more than 73,000 acre feet from the C25 basin going to the Indian River Lagoon up around Fort Pierce. Hey John, on, just on that one, sorry to do this to you, but we have tons of time, right? Um, I knew I was going to regret <laughs> yeah, saying you, that. Yeah, I knew you were. On the C23, C24, when, when that reservoir project is completed, would that 105.1 number come down and by like half or a quarter, or can you give me a magnitude? Um, not off the top of my head, but okay. yes, it will come down. Um, the idea with the two reservoirs located roughly right in this portion of the basins um, is to grab and attenuate that water and hold it back and slowly meter it out. I um, might have to go back and refresh my memory a little bit more on the modeling. Um, so the number is obviously going to change. It will reduce. Um, the extent of the reduction, I, I can't say right now. Um, simply because if, it, if you're just grabbing it and attenuating it and letting it out more slowly, the overall magnitude may be the same, but the timing shift is very important. So southern portion of the system, um, inflows into the water conservation areas have been just over 900,000 acre feet with roughly a third of that inflow coming from the west and the east sides here and here into the water conservation areas. Um, down into Everglades National Park, inclusive of some of this seepage return. Here and here, there's been just shy of 700,000 acre feet have been moved into the park. And the runoff coming off the lower east coast going to tide in the intercoastal waterway, about 1.4 million acre feet, and roughly 800,000 of that 1.4 million acre feet um, has been in the southern portion towards um, Biscayne Bay. So looking at the water levels in the conservation areas themselves, you can see area one had been above schedule pretty much all wet season so far. Um, but with that drying trend that we experienced during the month of August and the operations that the Corps of Engineers had implemented to move water from area one down into area two, you can see it's back to its regulation schedule. So you should anticipate that area one will start rising to get up here towards its winter pool. The similar type story, Oh, down in conservation area two had been above schedule pretty much all year um, so far and now it's right at its regulation schedule. Um, that is the result of the operations that the Corps had done to move water from two down into three but also um, the district operations to move water from area two to tide as area two is now right at its regulation schedule here. Um, we are no longer moving water to tide from area two. Um, and we're just using um, the S11 structures that separate area two and three to be able to manage um, water levels within conservation area two. So going down to three, as you can imagine, transitioning that water down through the system resulted in area three. Going above its schedule, it still remains above its schedule, but you sort of see that inflection right here in that downward trend of water levels in area three, the result of the reductions of transitioning that water down through the system as well as the drying trend that I said um, was the month of August. But be that as it may, it's still above regulation schedule, so we're doing maximum releases out of Area 3, both through the 344s, 343s, all of the S12s, A, B, C, and D, and through the 333 structure into the L29 canal and promoting all of that water um, down into the park. Looking back at the STAs, um, so far this water year, um, the STAs have treated just under um, 700,000 uh, acre feet of primarily basin runoff coming through the stormwater treatment areas into um, the conservation areas. 
So what the future may hold, um, Climate Prediction Center, we're still staring down the El Nino forecast for the upcoming dry season. So through February of 24, they're still predicting above average rainfalls during the dry season um, as we move farther and forward in time. What I can say, looks like it may be a wet weekend here in South Florida, depending on where you live. These green shaded areas are gonna be some pretty decent rainfalls on the order of an inch or so aerial over that region. Um, but right now, it uh, looks like the second week out may be more of a, a drier trend and um, get a little bit of break from some of these rains that uh, we'll probably experience over the weekend and into the early next week. And with that, I uh, came in at 13 minutes. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, John. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Mr. Mitnick? Thanks. Lawrence? Okay, thank you very much. And per John's request, I'll go back to speak like I did when I was 10 and talk real slow. <laughs> but uh, I'm always happy to bring you the ecological conditions update. And this, this picture is really good for perspective. Uh, Brent Anderson, the photographer, is standing, taking that picture in a fire flag marsh. And so that's how, how big these, these plants are. Starting up at the top at the Kissimmee, um, conditions are uh, pretty dry. Um, as John said, we're retaining water in uh, Lake Kissimmee, which provides water to the Kissimmee River. Um, we're going to continue to do that through the season so we can be providing this minimal discharge of 300 CFS. Um, of course, the river would like more, but if we were to be making greater releases and we're not having a bunch of volume in Kissimmee right now, it would promulgate probably having to stop releases at some point during the dry season, so we don't want to do that. We want to main th maintain 300 CFS for flow, and that's really for dissolved oxygen conditions within the river. And as you see in this graph here, this is dissolved oxygen. This is the good range. We're at about five milligrams per liter right now, well above the two milligram per liter threshold where we start to see harm. <laughs> for Lake Okeechobee, uh, if you add all these numbers up, they're almost about even the amount of water that was coming in and the amount of water that's going out. Uh, we have 3,200 CFS of evapotranspiration, which is helping get some water off of the lake. Um, we also have a standing request recently of 2,000 CFS out of S79. And the basin runoff has been absorbing most of that, so we haven't been able to get water off the lake. And uh, this past week, we've actually been able, to, the Army Corps has been able to move uh, good volumes out of 77, so they're bringing the lake uh, down a little bit. Where we are in relation to the ecological envelope, um, we're parallel. You know, not borrowing, borrowing a storm. Uh, what's going to happen with El Nino, where we end up in here, not quite sure, but it, it looks really good. We've talked about dodging the bullet with that storm. And, and could have jumped up dramatically. Um, we're looking fairly decent at this point in time. And what you see at this stage of 15, almost the entire marsh is full. Um, I appreciate Scott Martin's uh, comment on, you know, what can we do with vegetation work? Uh, you see, this is Moonshine Bay. Uh, we did in 2014 and 2015, 16, along with FWC, we did about eight thousand acres of cattail reduction out of this area and that's why you see Moonshine Bay opened up the way it is. Uh, between us and FWC all these blue pockets that you see where there is water in the marsh is some of that work that we've done in those past years. Um, one of the things about high lake stage is you can't really go in and do vegetation work in high lake stage because if you're going to do plantings it's too deep for them to survive after that. We really need uh, stages to come down to about 12 and be there for about three months for us to go in and do substantial work that is going to have benefit. So that is part of the district's low lake level plan that we have on a shelf ready to go when we do get to that area. And FWC also has a vegetation management plan over the next two years of work that they can do when conditions are appropriate. The bloom potential 
is looking great on the lake. We, we've seen a dramatic reduction um, as we've moved through. We talk about what those drivers are. Really, it's this dissolved inorganic nitrogen that has been removed because of the bloom conditions that happened through the summer. And where we go and we see, I talked about, we're starting to see changes in dominance by microcystis to having mixed communities of algae. Um, a lot of this low level uh, toxin production was important because that toxin is very nitrogen rich, so it is also using up that. So here is collections that were taken in the beginning of August, and if you compare that to two weeks later, look at the change in the ability to create toxin. So that's really cool, along with look at how the, the community structure is also changing. So we are really, in my opinion, on the downslope of the peak of the blue-green algae season on Lake Okeechobee. We do have preliminary results for our submerged aquatic vegetation work that's going on. Uh, we've completed about 75% of the grid samples that we do. Um, the red marks areas that we lost SAV to Ian. And then in the time since Ian, this gold color marks where we have lost vegetation. We do have some areas of gain. It, it's not enough really to make up that difference. We currently have about 2,500 acres of SAV in the lake. That's our estimate currently. Um, we might make up another 500 in the sampling that we're doing that will culminate at the end of this month. But 2,500 acres to 3,000 acres is not enough in the lake. Um, it, it doesn't provide the, the cleansing that the lake needs. It doesn't provide the habitat that the lake needs. So. Um, you know, if we are able to start this wet season, you know, at a lower level and get down to that below 13, 12 and a half would be wonderful um, in order to see some good recruitment from SAV uh, next year. So you're at the, um, we are at the sort of the um, most stress condition in terms of um, uh, amount of SAV since 2006, right? Correct. And what, can you remind me what the, what the difference between vascular and non-vascular? Uh, vascular is, the, so the non-vascular is, it's a macro algae. It's very ephemeral. Uh, Cara is the one species that we have most. It grows real fast and real abundantly. But what it does when, when that comes in, it kind of creates a stable environment for the vascular plants, the regular emergent vegetation, or uh, submergent vegetation like coontail, uh, pondweed, uh, val uh, area, you know, you look down and you see that looks like a plant. So there's a reason that you get the non-vascular before the The, the non-vascular is great. It comes okay. in, it's kind of a, what's called a pioneer species. It can come in and, and quickly uh, cover an area and then it can create conditions that allow the, the next level of succession to come in behind it. And the, and the significant improvement between 06 and 07, do you remember what the, how, did the lake stage down for quite a while, more than the three months that you just talked there, about? There's, there's two, that one actually filled quickly. Um, but if you go back to, and you look at 2011, I think it was, because I was talking to the scientists about this, we had one year where we got low, and then we had a very slow refill. So if you think about being low, and, and your stage is kind of low, it, it allows plants to grow, and as it's going quick, going slowly, it allows those plants to grow, then it goes to the next depth that allows plants to grow. So you get this coverage up slope that is fantastic. Um, what we would be concerned about is having low lake stage and then having a quick ascension rate that would then, you know, basically not allow photosynthesis to occur in that deeper water for those plants that had just reestablished. So you want a, a slow ascension behind a low lake level is best condition for recruitment of SAV. Uh, moving to the estuaries and the St. Lucie, uh, as I mentioned last month, we haven't had lake releases uh, since the end of April. And you'll notice this decline in, in rainfall and, and discharge into the St. Lucie and you have seen a concurrent increase in salinity, which is good. So we've gone to an area where the forks were very, very fresh, 
to where we have a nice salinity gradient running through the estuary. And in response to that, we have seen some pretty decent recruitment occurring for uh, oysters. And one thing, we look at the, the salinity envelope for adult oysters, and it's 10 to 25 is the good range. The spat, the young oysters, they like about 15 to 35. They like it more saline. So that's one of the reasons we're not seeing as, as great a recruitment over here. And when I should get to the St. Lucie, where it's been a little saltier, we've had a little better response. But this is a good response, because you see good here is about five spat average per show. <clears throat> Last month, I came and I compared the 2024 dry season and wet season to each other. Now I'm comparing last year's wet season and this year's wet season for what we're seeing in seagrass in the St. Lucie. Um, you're seeing a pretty decent distribution through this part of the estuary, but remember, this is very low coverage, and the most is 4% is of, a, of a meter quadrat. So we have little sprigs. Um, we have mostly halophila, and I was asking the staff, why are we seeing this difference between halophila decepiens and halidulli? And the reason is twofold. This is more of an ephemeral plant, and it likes saltier water. We've had uh, a much fresher estuary this year, where halidulli likes a little, uh, has a wider range. It can handle that, that not as fresh condition. And also, Halophila, just like we talked about Kara, it's one of those pioneer species that can come in and make conditions appropriate for a, a, another species to come in behind it. Uh, coming over to the Caloosahatchee, we've also had here uh, not as much rainfall, and you've seen this salinity gradient change a bit as the freshwater is moving back up estuary. Um, that does make it a little bit um, out of the salinity preference at uh, shell point for oysters, but let, look what's going on with recruitment. We have a real big jump right now. This is a great peak we're seeing um, at shell point and seeing some good recruitment as well up at Coral, at Cape Coral. And over on this side, just like, like last month when I came in here, basically we're seeing plants in their preferred salinity range as we're coming down the estuary. And really, the, the, the biggest take-home message I have for this side is the, the response of Vallisneria to our operations over the past year or so. This species, and here's Vallisneria, and, and they're small sprigs. They're small plants right now, and, and they're not in great um, cover, but they only grew within cages. Uh, over the past until really we got to these operations. We would go out, uh, cage, grow plants inside of it. As soon as you took the cage off, they were eaten. But now, because conditions are good throughout this whole part, we're seeing growth by itself. We're not planting these, it's natural recruitment. And the take home message is we're, we're starting to get it right on this side from a salinity standpoint. And that's fantastic. Looking at the stormwater treatment areas, as John had mentioned, there's about 686,000 acre feet have uh, flown through the STAs to date. Only two from uh, Lake Okeechobee. Remember, it's the dry season that we start thinking about flows from the lake. But look at performance. Um, we've got about the same as last month, 2019, 13 in STA2, 12 in STA 3.4, it's fantastic, and a drop from 56 to 40 uh, this month, or in, over this past month in uh, STA 5.6. Uh, we've seen a reduction in depths uh, over since last month, uh, getting closer and closer to that preferred target. The western flowway of STA 1 East is the only flowway offline. And that, that's a great testament to the work that we've been doing inside these and preparing them for taking water. So kudos to the team for their hard work. Wanted to show you some of the work that we have been doing in the estuaries. Um, within flowway three of cell two, there's this borrow canal that was used to, 
to create the levy in between cell flowway three and flowway two. Uh, when it was constructed, they left plugs across here so that you wouldn't have water flow from here straight down to the G334 structure where we take a water quality sample. You know, you would have untreated water that bypassed all of the marsh. Um, these, these plugs had eroded and we were able to go back in and recreate those so that in high water, we won't have that bypass of water going straight down and giving us a reading that is, is erroneous to compare to what's going on with phosphorus reduction in the rest of the STA cell. The eastern flowway, this has been offline for two years. We went in and, and totally redid this after this cell had crashed. Remember, it had delaminated. We had floating tussocks throughout the cell. We went through, dried it down. Uh, we went through and actually roller chopped that, uh, got rid of a lot of the material, replanted, and it is back online. And you saw that this STA as a whole is hitting 12 parts per billion. So the work that we do in the dry season is so important. The work that we've been doing through restoration strategies and the refurbishment is so important because we can go back and restore these cells when they've been worked really hard and get them performing to where we can meet Cuba. Uh, some of the work that we have done in there as well, remember we installed dissipators at the lower end of the inflow structure. So water was coming in here and it, was, it didn't have anything to disrupt it and it started creating these short circuits. So we went in and put in these dissipators and we found in some instances even the dissipator wasn't big enough to take care of short circuiting around it. So field station went in and created these wing walls on, on specific ones so that this short circuit can heal. Remember the short circuit will bring if floating aquatic vegetation gets in, which is a nuisance, it can take it into the center of the STA, which we don't want. So this is great in, in creating a barrier to that. Biscayne Bay is looking really good uh, from a salinity standpoint. We've had a lot of inflow and that has driven uh, salinity down. Coming into the Everglades, changes that we've seen since last month, uh, notice that this lighter green and this blue is deeper water in area two and we have, the Army Corps has moved a lot of water out of the uh, water conservation area too to where it's in a very much better shape. Um, we don't have any yellows here at the top of water conservation area 3A, which is something we are concerned about. Come down into Everglades National Park, you have connectivity in Lossman Slough, Shark River Slough, Taylor Slough. This is a really good setup going into uh, kind of at the end of the, the wet season going into the dry season, especially from a wading bird standpoint. This is an aerial, so if this top part of water conservation area two right here, you can see the chip project that we had. This is the cat, cattail habitat improvement project where all of this area is very, very dense cattail. This is where we realized that we were neutrifying the, the Everglades and we came up with what we we're gonna do for Cubo. These are 250 meter by 250 meter plots, almost 15 acres, where we went in and removed all the cattail, opened it up, allowed for a new succession of plants to come through to see if, if this sort of, of activity was good from a restoration standpoint. And we had some unique visitors in there this past week, which is pretty cool have uh, flamingos that are coming in and they're feeding within this calcareous type of sediment. They have a really neat kind of sieve bill where they'll grab a, a mouthful and, and keep the bugs and let the rest of the stuff come out. So that's just kind of neat that those are restoration target, but it's a place where we would like to be. Uh, if restoration target is actually salinities below this. Uh, we have seen some fluctuations over the past couple of weeks where we just rainfall and what's coming out from outflow from the creeks and everything uh, is, is still in a, in a good setup currently. Um, I would like to see us a little deeper into here going forward, but from where we are right now, uh, we're, we're per staged pretty well in Florida Bay from a salinity standpoint. And I thank you and we'll take any questions. Thanks. 
I'll go first and then let everyone else go up. Can you go back to slide 17? Certainly. Thanks. So I, I may have asked this before and I'll probably keep asking it forever. On 5.6, the 247, right, I mean, that sort of sticks out like a sore thumb. Um, will the FEB bring that number down? It will. Okay. Uh, what we've seen in the, in the A1 FEB is there are times when the A1 FEB, it's a shallow uh, facility just like the STA. And we have water at times coming out of the FEB at Cubo. So its ability to do a first blush reduction of those waters will bring that number down. I don't know to what it will, but it will do a, a very good pre-cleansing before we actually move water into um, SGA 5.6. Do we know what the correlations are between the number going in and the number coming out? There's a lot of factors right, right, in there. Okay. Yeah. So you got a lot of, a lot of external variables yes, working sir. there. Um, okay, and is, is there anything we can go, do to get the 247 down that could be done without, through either best management practice or something else without structures on our part? Um, I'm not, I would have to push that off and bring you back information. I'm not as familiar with the C-139 as I am with the EAA in total. Okay. It's, I, it's I just because that number is so high. Sure. Comparatively, it's, it, it, again, it does stick out like a sore thumb. It would be nice to know if, if, if we could bring that down, then it would be easier to meet you belt all along. Thanks. Anyone else have questions? I'm sorry. Jennifer? I was just going to take a stab at answering that, that question Please do. for you. The, the short answer is yes. There are things that, that we can do and that we are working with um, FDACs and with DEP to take a look at areas where we are seeing uh, higher water quality um, nutrient concentration numbers than what we'd like to see. And so we, we work with um, our coordinating agencies as well as our permitting department to take a look at all opportunities to make sure we're looking at uh, sources of those nutrients and projects or programs that we can um, tweak or um, modify or implement better in order to bring those numbers down. Great, that's encouraging. Anyone else have questions for Lawrence? Get off easy. Thanks very much, that was great. Yeah. Mr. Butler, uh, not so easy. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna slow roll in here. Um, without beating our heads against the wall within the lake, SAV, I'm going to ask it again. Anything we can do in the, in the current conditions? In current I mean, conditions, can, can, current I mean, conditions, no. At the lake at, at, at 15 plus, I mean, there, there's no areas where you could go in and, and do work that would remain viable. I mean, you, you said it. it I mean, that's yeah, when we need yeah. to get the lake down to below 12 to. Correct. Get on the marshes and Correct. do some work or, so or, or, or work, we'll work, that, work that we do within the lake from a vegetation standpoint is a dry season activity and it depends on lake stage at that time and how long you've been at a specific lake stage. Because if you're doing work out in the marsh, you have to make sure that you know you've got your soil is, is compacted, you know, everything that's going on that's gonna be helpful. If you're moving machinery out there you don't want to get bogged down. So there, there's a stage and a duration at that stage that is required in order to go do that. Um, I think Jay was kind of, Jay or Chauncey, who was going down the, the Jay, wasn't it, going down, talking about the SAV. Um, the 07 and 2011, John, what was happening in those years? I mean, I think, I think Jay quizzed Lawrence, but John didn't jump in. But uh, I mean, what, what allowed that what, what was the lake doing that allowed that just boom to take off on that first, was it vascular and then non-vascular? There was a drought. It was a drought, okay. And do droughts happen in El Nino years? <laughs> <laughs> so, mixing and matching. So let's separate a drought from a climatological lack of rainfall okay. from just low water levels. Um, in 2006, 2007, you had both. You had lack of rainfall and drought, and then that forced low lake levels. Um, there have been other times, which I don't need to refresh everybody's memory on, where low lake levels have been induced through other mechanisms.
but and as Lawrence has said several times before, um, to promote that SAV regrowth, you've got to get it back down into the ecological band and have that um, um, period of time where they can generate and and continue to grow. Um, during uh, an El Nino-like forecast, it's unlikely that you'll get down to those lower lake levels that were in 2006 and 2011. And you've already answered this for me, but if we were operating in low sum right now and the recovery mode was tripped, let's, let's assume recovery mode was tripped, could we enter recovery mode this coming year? So if I recall the way the proposed LOSOM framework is, um, there are th three triggers to initiate a recovery mode, and then there are also triggers to cancel or abort out of the recovery mode. And one of those triggers is an El Nino forecast. That would prevent Correct. from entering the recovery, even though recovery was tripped. Correct, because yeah. the likelihood of success under an El Nino condition is low. And you would therefore cause harm to the estuaries by moving that water and still not achieve your goal. Okay. All right, thank you. Is that it? Thanks. Thank you. We'll go now to uh, staff reports and uh, we'll do the monthly financial report with Ms. Heater. Good afternoon. The monthly financial report that your staff prepared for you is through the month of July. Um, thus far through July, we have collected in new revenue $767 million, and we have spent $714 million. From June to July, we collected an additional $43 million, and then we spent $50 Seven million. So right now you're sitting um, through the month of July at 99.4 percent collection rate. Um, I checked before I came down, and uh, as of month, the monthly financial report for July, you still had about 1.7 million dollars to collect. We've collected an additional million three, so you're we're still about 400 thousand before we collect all of our revenues for ad valorem. So we're sitting in. Uh, good shape as far as collecting our recurring revenues. Yes, sir. That's about average, isn't it? I mean, what, what, what do we normally wind up? With? We typically yeah. wind up with full collection. <laughs> full collection. And actually sometimes a little more because of prior year values okay. um, or prior years that people haven't paid that they then pay, et cetera. So, okay. And we budget about 96%, um, so we give that 4% um, cushion for people to pay early and not everyone pays early. That's right. So. Yeah, that's right. Tax deed sales wind up, right, or am I going off the wrong way? Say, I'm sorry? I was talking ad valorem's tax deed sales that, that kind of put, makes the final push, right? That, yes, it does. Yeah, okay. yeah. and that typically occurs ooh, from right June, July time yeah. frame. Okay. Yeah. And then they start trickling in towards the end of your, your fiscal year. Okay. Um, cash flow, we in a good shape? I know you were worried about that a month or so ago. So cash flow, um, we've, had a, we've had some challenges, um, but we are working on those challenges. And how we are going to, um, I mean, we've not been to the point where we can't make our bills, <laughs> but it's just getting tight. Um, because uh, the, about the ratio of our monthly expenditures is you know, reimbursable revenues. So the dollar that goes out that you're covering that will come back to you is almost 50%, 50 to 52% of your expenditures. So because you're spending your you know, cash balances down, um, that's becoming a little bit more challenging on a cash flow basis. So um, we are currently working with um, the department to come up with a more expedient way to maybe um, get revenues into the agency, you know, at, on, you know, quicker. <laughs> Good. Yes. I, I know they've, they've been helpful in the past from four years ago. They're, yes. they're quicker than they were four years ago. And yes. 
it seems like we need them even faster. Yeah, as a team, um, you know, we've we work very closely together. I mean, we have monthly meetings. We sometimes meet biweekly, um, and and we you know brainstorm together on how you know we can use our teams <laughs> to be more efficient, et cetera. So yes, we're we're work, working with them. Thanks. Thank you. And you know. Cash flow challenge is not new, and no. you, you said you've already kind of gone through some techniques, but there's more techniques. I mean, just yes. how many more techniques out there are there? <laughs> are, we, are we about to run out? You know, sometimes until you're pushed, you just don't keep thinking. So, no. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I but commend no. you all. I commend no. you all for, thank for, you. for, for yeah. making it work. Yeah, thank you. So the taxpayer commends you, too. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, I greatly appreciate that. But, you know, it's it's... There's a bunch of people behind me that make things happen. <laughs> Any other? All right. Thanks. Thank you. So the general counsel's once again slipped the, off the agenda. That's, <laughs> I'm assuming you have no report. Yeah, Mr. I just figured we not we don't want to put on the agenda unless we have one. Understood. Yeah. I just like seeing it there. But. <laughs> it gives you comfort. Huh? Yeah. Wait, no, it's not forgotten. Um, we'll go to general public comment now, if there we is have, any. We have none, Mr. Chairman. Great. Okay, the board has exactly oh, an hour to. My, my apologies, sorry. We actually have two on Zoom. Here we go. We'll start with Mark Perry, followed by Scott Martin. Mr. Perry, you can unmute your mic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. We're um, just wanted to make a final kind of observation on the, you know, the amount of water going south um, to through the STAs and into the water conservation areas. It's all been coming from basin runoff with over 650,000 acre feet um, and nothing coming from the lake. So if we really were active at lowering the lake when maximum practicable sending water south from the lake Okeechobee like the schedule calls for we could have been lowering the lake but we're keeping the uh, canals down artificially low at about 10.5 feet or less uh, in in Miami North New River and Hillsborough Canal so all of that um, basin runoff coming off has kept the uh, EA very very low in water table for for their purpose but unfortunately taking up all the capacity of being able to send water south I do appreciate the fact that the STAs are now all pretty much online and working, and that's wonderful and great. Um, but again, just keep looking at that graph that uh, Mr. Mitnick puts out as uh, how much is basin runoff uh, in the EA basin runoff compared to how much lake water is being sent south. And as we get into low some uh, schedule, hopefully at the end of this year, we, we're going to want to be able to send more of that water south from the lake rather than um, to the estuaries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Next, we'll hear from Scott Martin. Mr. Martin, please unmute your mic. How about now? Yes, we um, can hear you. All righty, thank you again. Scott Martin, Anglers for Lake Okeechobee. Uh, been a great meeting so far. I'm getting learning a lot of great things, and I'm so glad that everybody's in tune with what's going on uh, around the lake and, of course, south of the lake. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, Mr. Glenn's comments on the aquatic vegetation and the state of the lake right now. Uh, as I've grown up here on the lake my entire life, I've, I've seen uh, the submerged vegetation dwindle down to where we're at now at 2,500 acres, which is virtually nothing. One thing I want to want to rise uh, to question and also ask some of these presenters to start paying attention to is when we talk about vegetation in Lake Okeechobee, submerged vegetation, we should as big as Lake Okeechobee is, we should consider breaking this down into quadrants. I, I mentioned this uh, last year. We should consider breaking Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee down into quadrants of, of information, meaning the, the north quadrant, the west quadrant, the east quadrant, and the south quadrant, and how much submerged vegetation is in those each quadrants. Because at that 2,500 acres of submerged vegetation that we currently have, I would say 80% of it is on the north shore of Lake Okeechobee. Uh, we live down here in Clewiston. We have a, 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 a community that depends on fishing and depends on tourism and depends on the wildlife. And there's manatees that live here and ducks that try to try to come here as well. 
And here around the Clewiston area, which I would consider more like the southwest quadrant, we have virtually zero acres of submerged vegetation. Uh, when you look at the southern end of the lake around Belle Glade, uh, there's virtually zero acres of submerged vegetation. So as big as this lake is, I, I, think, it's, I, think, uh, I think it's time that we start looking at the lake in quadrants so we can start to understand how dire um, us not having submerged vegetation in the lake is. Because as, as this number grows, this 2,500 acre may grow, but, it, but, but, but again, it's very important to realize that there are certain very important parts of this lake that have zero uh, that traditionally had tons. Uh, and that's my question. As far as planting vegetation in the lake, I understand that Mr. Glenn talks about the, the lake levels being a little too high. I, I, would, I would say that it's not the high water that's the problem. I would say it's the light penetration is the issue. So I think we could definitely identify some areas around Lake Okeechobee, say farther back in these marshes like the Monkey Box and some certain areas that we could, South Bay, for example, that we could start planting vegetation immediately. Um, and I think it would be successful. We just have to identify those areas. And, and I think for us to sit back and wait for a drought just to even start the process is silly. I think we should immediately jump on planting grass where we can and identify some of those places because, again, we're in desperate need of that habitat. The other thing that we can do in Lake Okeechobee that the funding would be much needed for is opening up some of the marshes so we can get this lake to breathe and open up some habitat behind that. They talked about the habitat they opened up in Moonshine Bay years ago. We need more of that. So funding we need immediately and we need to pay attention to what we can do now because we're in, we're dying here again we're dying and we just need the help and i just uh, appreciate ben butler's comments as well as far as the uh uh the recovery zone and the recovery mode and all the good things but you know i'm, I'm hopeful that we can all come up with a plan that helps mm -hmm. like it could show me right now not sit around and wait for some miracle drought yes thank you mr martin mr chairman we have no additional comments on this item great thank you and thank you all for your comments We'll move now to uh, board comment, and uh, Ben, I'll start with you again. Happy belated birthday, Colonel Roman. Glad you party hard and couldn't make it to the meeting today, but uh, glad you joined us online. <laughs> uh, we'll go to Miss Meads. I can barely breathe. Sorry, <laughs> he's got me laughing. S sorry, Colonel Roman. I apologize for that. Now, I wanted to thank you for the heroic life that you have lived. We just went through 9-11. I know where I was that day. One of these days, I'm going to ask you where you were. But um, that you would leave that service and come and serve here the way you have with excellence. We are grateful for you. Happy birthday. Mr. Steinle. Well said. Happy birthday, Charlotte. Um, I would, you know, the, I'm glad that we talked a lot more and, and, and heard um, Scott's comments about the lake. You know, and, and, and in the long process of Losum, um, it's, I think everybody has accepted that it, it, the lake is more of a loser than any, anything else. Um, so to the extent, and, we've, and you've suggested this, Ben, but to the extent that there are ways to think um, uh, more creatively around um, uh, you know, improving the health of the ecosystem in the lake while we are having these uh, higher uh, levels, Lawrence, I think, um, I think would make sense. Um, you know, I, I think in our briefing, uh, I heard that uh, in a typical dry season, we lose what about three feet of water. Yep. So, so that's assuming no storm, um, we could be in the twelve and a half. But you know, but we can't assume that. So, um, I think it's a good point. Not knowing enough about our other options, I just suggest if there are are things to think about that we do that. Uh, and that the lake, um, the lake deserves that extra attention, uh, given its, given the, the uh, you know, the situation uh, it's in with uh, with Losum. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Vice Chair. Sorry, uh, I had to find the unmute button. Um, 
I just wanted to make a comment to say uh, thank you to the staff, especially with regard to, um, you know, not only everything they do, but the C-43, um, as everybody mentioned, uh, is a huge project for us. It's one I think we all thought would go better. Um, it's hard enough to be in charge of a project from day one. It's certainly more difficult to have to step into uh, a mess and and take over. And I think everybody needs to be commended uh, once again for the wonderful work that you all have done on that. So thank you. Thanks. Well said, uh, Mr. Martinez. Happy birthday, Charlotte. And that's it for me. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Mr. Bergeron. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Well, happy birthday to the Colonel with good health and happiness. And uh, I feel the same way as Scott in regards to the C-43 and how our staff is uh, taking the project and uh, moving forward and long live the Everglades. Thank you, Mr. Bergeron. Uh, Colonel Roman, you can now respond to Mr. Butler. <laughs> yeah, I'll never tell, Chauncey. I'll never tell, but he must have heard the rumors about the party. <laughs> um, I want to say thank you, everyone, for, for the heartfelt birthday wishes. It, it really means a lot to me. And all kidding aside, uh, I wish that I could be with you today but uh, in person, but uh, this is the best I have today. So thank you so much for your understanding. I, I wanted to follow up with um, comments that were made by Scott Martin. Uh, you know, Scott and I had spent some time on Lake Okeechobee, and I think he, he raises some really good points. And one of the things that I wanted to just highlight again is the fact that uh, I'm still working with James Erskine and his team who are looking for that, that way to maybe uh, section off a part of that lake and do some science with returning the submerged aquatic vegetation in an area that maybe we can help advance the, the health of the lake without waiting until uh, we have a different operating structure. So uh, that's still active, and I just wanted to share that with you. But thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll wrap this up. Um, I, I want to comment a little bit on what uh, Mr. Martin said, too, because I, 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 I can sense the frustration in his voice, and I've, I've been there. And I, I, I know exactly, I think, how you feel, and it's, it's, it is frustrating. And I think it just means that we need to look at options, and I don't know what all those options are, and I think we've got a really bright staff here. I, I know there's things we can do, and I think we, we need to be doing them, and I think we, probably as board members, it's our job to push a little bit to say, okay, let's, let's look at that. Maybe it's not normal, but let's look at it. And Mr. Perry mentioned something about canal levels. Uh, we had another option of you know, doing something differently with vegetation. You know, there, there are things that probably can be done, so maybe we start looking at that um, as we move forward to try and figure out a way to get, get the lake down a little bit, um, particularly if we're coming into an El Nino. Um, and not to be outdone on the birthday um, front, I understand that uh, Mr. Bergeron may be having a birthday uh, coming up very shortly, like maybe f tomorrow. Um, so so I don't, you're not going to get off the hook either there, uh, Mr. Bergeron, but ha happy birthday to you. Um, and I'm going to adjourn this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have our fiscal year 2023-24 tentative millage rate tax roll, tentative budget public hearing today at 515. If you're joining us um, by meeting by Zoom, it'll be the same link you use to get into this one. And if there's nothing further, this meeting's adjourned.